Scientists today are able to say what areas of the world are at risk for earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. They can even make long-term forecasts about when these phenomena might occur. Yet scientists aren't at a point where they can make many short-term predictions. To some extent, their hands are tied. If a prediction turns out to be a false alarm, it can wreak havoc in a community. But the main reason is that much of what makes the Earth move and volcanoes erupt remains a mystery. Today on Innovation, we'll meet scientists who are trying to unlock the Earth's secrets so that society can better prepare for the inevitable release of its energy. Parkfield, California, population 34. A farming community about halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. There isn't much happening here right now, but sometime over the next seven years, most likely in 1988, scientists expect Parkfield will be rocked by an earthquake. It's unusual for the cautious U.S. Geological Survey to issue such a prediction, but it comes as no surprise to the residents here. An earthquake hits Parkfield about once every 22 years. Beneath the continents and oceans, more than a dozen plates make up the Earth's crust. They all move constantly and slowly, averaging less than an inch a year. When the plates rub together or collide, there are earthquakes along the boundary lines. In California, the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate meet at the San Andreas Fault. Movement on the fault causes about 15,000 earthquakes a year. Most are so small they're hardly felt, measuring less than three on the Richter scale. But in 1933, one rocked the set where W.C. Fields was making a movie. It killed 120 people in the Long Beach area. And in 1971, a magnitude 6.6 .6 quake in the San Fernando Valley killed 58 people and caused $500 million worth of damage. The San Andreas Fault runs right through Parkfield. Drop, you guys. The students in the one-room schoolhouse here are getting ready for the next time it ruptures. When not in the classroom, their teacher, Dwayne Hammond, moonlights for the U.S. Geological Survey. The survey is using Parkfield as a laboratory to study what happens before, during, and after an earthquake. Three times a week, Hammond takes readings of ground movement near the San Andreas Fault. He aims a laser beam at a series of reflectors on hilltops across the fault. By measuring the time it takes the light to reach a reflector and return, it's possible to detect a change in the Earth's surface to within half an inch. The U.S. Geological Survey is using a variety of other techniques to measure changes in Parkfield. A creep meter set in the ground is connected to a wire that gets pulled when the fault moves. This sets off an alarm beamed by satellite to the survey office in Menlo Park, California. Geologists drill a 1,000-foot hole into which they will sink a sensor to record ground motion. Readings from a number of these sensors are sent to Menlo Park by telephone line. In addition to the instruments at Parkfield, the U.S. Geological Survey has a network of sensors in place throughout California. Earthquakes occur deep in the earth and they are a sudden release of energy. Um, and there's a certain random process to that. And at this point, we do not know enough about the exact physical process that causes an earthquake to occur. Hey, we know on the general thing that it's slip on a fault that's driven by plate tectonics. Um, but why an earthquake happens today and not yesterday or not tomorrow, we don't know at this point. And that's the sort of information we need to, to understand to be able to predict earthquakes. At the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, researchers are using information from sensors in California and other stations around the world to understand the process that causes earthquakes. Dr. Robert Clayton has devised a way to produce images of the Earth's interior for the first time. They are like x-rays in color. These are various views of the Earth beneath Southern California. Seismic tomography is a technique that is very similar to one that is used in medicine known as x-ray tomography. With x-ray tomography, x-rays are fired through the head of a patient and by observing x-rays at many different angles through the head, they can form an image of the brain of the uh, patient. On seismic tomography, we use 
earthquake sources instead of x-rays, and we use receivers that are distributed all around the globe. The waves are emitted from the earthquakes and travel through the center of the Earth to the receivers. The speed at which they travel depends upon the material they're actually going through. And what we would like to do is determine an image, or a map, if you like, of those speed variations within the interior of the Earth. This will perhaps help us tell what the actual materials are in the interior of the Earth. What we have here is a computer animation of what we think is happening in the Earth beneath Southern California. Convection occurs when cold material sinks and hot material rises. And what we see here is cold material beginning to sink uh, into the Earth here beneath Southern California. We think that as this cold material sinks, it draws the surface of the Earth together. And that pulling of the surface together then gives us uh, earthquakes here in the crust. On the southern part of the San Andreas Fault, Pat Williams, a geology graduate student, is literally breaking new ground. Near the desert town of Indio, he's uncovering evidence that shows where the fault slipped during past earthquakes dating back hundreds of years. This work will shed light on when the next earthquake might hit. Williams is working under the guidance of Dr. Carrie C., who has done pioneering research in the field known as paleo-seismology. Layers of sand and silt and clay are laid down across an active fault, and then when the fault moves during a great earthquake, uh, the layers record the deformation, and then succeeding layers are not deformed. And so when you dig into those layers, you can see the level that was the ground surface at the time of the earthquake. And if you can date that layer, you can tell what the date of the earthquake was, and you can tell uh, how much offset occurred, how big the earthquake was. This sand and clay was deposited in a lake which filled 300 years ago. And we know the age of these units by little flecks of carbon that we can date. These carbon materials very likely originated in an Indian campfire. And we can see fractures <coughs> that separate horizons in this youngest lake sediment. Those are evidence for us of prehistoric earthquakes. It looks like the interval between slip events is at least every 250 years, if not less. And uh, we know there has not been a great earthquake there since at least 1850, a, lot, a moderate earthquake, a major earthquake. And we know there hasn't been a great earthquake probably since at least 1790. So uh, we've got to be very close We've got to be very close to the uh, recurrence interval there. And, and uh, uh, I personally think it looks fairly ominous, but, but all the information isn't in yet. A similar excavation in Japan more clearly shows how layers separated during an earthquake. Japan is a leader in earthquake research, and with good reason. Devastating tremors regularly shake the country. The nature of the soil in some parts of Japan means that earthquakes can trigger massive landslides. Japanese scientists are studying the mechanism that causes them. Liquefaction is a process by which underground water boils up and the soil turns to quicksand. In addition to producing landslides, liquefaction can cause telephone poles to sink and buildings to roll over on their sides, as shown in this experiment with a model street. Liquefaction may have toppled some buildings during the recent earthquake in Mexico City. But much of the damage resulted from another phenomenon, according to Caltech professor James Beck. The thing that really stood out when we went down there was the um, amount of damage to modern high-rise buildings. And this is surprising at first glance because you might think that the old buildings, the old colonial buildings, for example, that weren't designed for earthquakes, might have suffered a lot of damage, but they didn't. And the reason is that much of Mexico City is built on a old lake bed. And this lake bed altered the character of the ground shaking so that it shook at long periods. And high-rise buildings are most sensitive to those long periods. So they got attacked much more severely during the earthquake than the low-rise, the old colonial buildings. For the most part, an earthquake is a man-made problem. Cracks in the ground don't kill people. Large buildings that collapse do. Specialists in earthquake engineering are searching for ways to build structures that are quake-proof. 
Bill Donlan of Caltech is studying what happens to a scale model of a dam when a simulated earthquake hits. The governments or cities that own these dams are concerned as to whether their reservoir can be filled or should remain half filled or whether these dams should not be used at all. And what we're trying to do is decide for them in a general way whether these dams are safe or not. Marie Levine is doing similar work all on a computer. Once she has described the dimensions of a bridge mathematically, she can calculate how it would perform when subjected to the motion of an earthquake. At the University of California at Berkeley, large-scale model testing is underway of an innovative approach to earthquake engineering. Base isolators are rubber bearings that separate a building from the ground that shakes beneath it. The flexible moorings function like shock absorbers. To date, only a few buildings have been constructed using this technique. But the building codes in Los Angeles have been rewritten to reflect some basic principles that should prevent a building from total collapse during an earthquake. The first step to do is to, uh, to ensure that you impose, you imagine some forces imposed sideways on the building and you design the building to withstand those forces. There are other rules of thumb that if an earthquake, uh, a structure behaves better if it's symmetric, if you don't have any discontinuities, if you have like walls that stop at the second floor and then you have open spaces just with columns at the first floor, you should avoid that sort of discontinuity. In Los Angeles, older buildings, not constructed according to these principles, now must be reinforced, otherwise they must be torn down. Wooden frame houses perform very well in an earthquake. So, despite the crack running through her kitchen, Glenda Jensen isn't worried. She feels safer in Parkfield than she would in the city. I have nothing to fall out here. Even my house is going to stand. Crack and all. Scientists hope that studies like the one at Parkfield someday will enable them to predict exactly where and when an earthquake will hit. Until then, the best defense we can have is well-built buildings, or no buildings at all, in places where the Earth is most likely to release its pent-up energy. While scientists are not yet able to predict earthquakes reliably, they're having a bit more luck with volcanoes. This is largely due to earthquakes themselves, which often signal a coming eruption. Scientists are trying to learn more about this volatile relationship so that communities can better plan for dangerous explosions. In the field and in the laboratory, geologists are searching for clues as to why molten mountains behave the way they do. When volcanoes erupt on Hawaii's biggest island, some of the natives believe it's because Madame Pele, the fire goddess, is angry. They think she may be disturbed by the quantity of marijuana grown there. In an effort to appease her, they give her offerings of gin. Scientists are searching for other explanations of what makes volcanoes erupt. During the rare simultaneous eruptions of Mauna Loa and Kilauea volcanoes in 1984, geologists from the nearby Volcano Observatory took to the field. I'm going to try to get ready to get up to it and measure the temperature. I don't know whether we can get to it or not, but we'll try. It's awful hot. When the volcanoes are quiet, scientists analyze gases from sulfur vents. They have found that the composition changes just before an eruption. Sensors buried near the volcano alert observatory scientists to earthquakes which signal an eruption may be imminent. The mechanism that causes these earthquakes is different from what produces quakes along fault lines. These earthquakes are actually a function of magma moving through the ground prior to the outbreak of uh, lava at the surface. Volcanoes are a natural part of the Earth cooling off. There is radioactive decay occurring within the Earth. And this produces heat, and the heat comes out. And to get a volcano, what you need to do is to take part of the deep interior of the Earth and raise it above its melting point. When you get a little bit of melt, the melt is about 10% less dense than the rocks that it replaces. 
And so since it's less dense, it rises like a lighter than air balloon and comes to the surface. Lava that flowed from Mauna Loa during the 1984 eruption came so close to the town of Hilo that residents were ready to evacuate. But generally, volcanoes like the ones in Hawaii aren't cause for worry. Rather than dangerous explosions, they produce lava flows that are continuing to expand the islands they created. Volcanoes and earthquakes play a, a major role in producing landforms. Uh, new islands and uh, uh, livable areas. Uh, Hawaii is a good example where the uh, area is growing and uh, creating new lands that may be uh, eventually uh, populated with people and uh, used for uh, agricultural purposes and so on. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a major form of disaster. Mount St. Helens is a different story. In May 1980, the volcano in Washington state exploded with the force equal to 500 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs. Earthquakes detected by scientists about a week before the eruption prompted the evacuation of most residents at risk. Nevertheless, 60 people died and 232 square miles were devastated. The behavior of St. Helens and other explosive volcanoes is influenced by the movement of plates making up the Earth's crust. Heat generated from the Juan de Fuca plate moving under the North American plate triggered the St. Helens eruption. Ever since that day, scientists have been trying to figure out if the volcano is dead or only asleep. In addition to earthquake monitoring, they're watching out for abnormal growth of St. Helens' dome. Things have been pretty quiet lately. That worries us a great deal because uh, what this means is that uh, the, there's a possibility that the next eruption will be quite violent. Dr. Michael Carr is trying to figure out what features characterize volcanoes that are violent. At his Rutgers University laboratory in New Brunswick, New Jersey, he's analyzing lava rock samples from Central America's 40 volcanoes. Among other things, Dr. Carr and his research team are looking for evidence that water is present in the lava of these volcanoes. Those with lava containing water are the most explosive. The aluminum content of lavas may be related to their water content. And there is a systematic variation in aluminum content from places like Guatemala, where the crust is thick, to Nicaragua, where the crust is thin. And roughly speaking, the Guatemalan volcanoes have been very explosive, and many of the Nicaraguan volcanoes have produced primarily lava flows. So hopefully, we'll eventually make a connection between the sort of lab research that we do and practical hazard considerations for the people who live in these places. Before November 13, 1985, the people living in Armero, Colombia, didn't consider the volcano 30 miles away much of a hazard. But the eruption of Nevada del Ruiz melted snow and ice crowning the mountain and triggered a mud flow that killed over 20,000 people. Could this tragedy have been prevented? It's really quite difficult to prevent tragedies such as occurred at Armero. For from a scientific point of view, it was clear that the volcano was becoming active again because earthquakes started over a year prior to the eruption that killed so many people. It is a matter in this particular case, how can scientists convey to the public, to government agencies, that a danger is imminent, and in particular, it is very difficult because the scientists cannot be quite sure on what time scale is the danger imminent. Scientists are now most concerned about volcanoes near Naples, Italy, and Papua New Guinea. Earthquake activity suggests that they could erupt soon, but there's no way to know for certain. It could be that the most dangerous volcano is the volcano that's just sitting there, covered with trees, and nobody knows or cares much about it. Nobody bothers to visit it because it hasn't done anything in historic time. That one may have been sitting there for 500 years, and it may be ready to blow up tomorrow.
While the eastern part of the United States doesn't need to worry about volcanoes, Leonardo Sieber believes we should be concerned about earthquakes. I spoke to him at the Lamont Doherty Geological Observatory, a part of Columbia University, in Palisades, New York. Mr. Sieber is a research scientist there. I asked him about the history of earthquakes in this region. Well, the eastern U.S. has seen many earthquakes, not as many as the western U.S., but some of these earthquakes are very big. Uh, big in the sense that they affected a very large area. Uh, the earthquakes I'm referring to are the 1811-1812 earthquake in New Madrid and the Charleston earthquake in South Carolina. What would be the range of some of these quakes on the East Coast? The New Madrid earthquake that would be in St. Louis, um, uh, near St. Louis, Missouri, uh, affected, um, they were damaged in South Carolina of uh, chimneys falling, and uh, bells were ringing in, in Boston, Massachusetts. So this earthquake uh, was felt throughout the eastern U.S. and had and could have done damage over an area that, that uh, involved several states around the epicenter. We think we understand the mechanism of quakes in California. How does it work on the East Coast? We really don't know, and uh, I think that's one of the major question that uh, we seismology in the East have to go after. Are there areas in other parts of the world that would be similar to the eastern part of the United States that you can study and, and draw some conclusions about what might happen here or what's happening here? The most obvious right away is Canada, for example. The Canadian sh uh, area, uh, shield area, has had quite a few earthquakes and uh, um, there is quite a substantial effort in seismology in Canada going on right now mm -hmm. and so we are collaborating many issues with them. Yeah. Another important area that uh, we should study is China. China has a um, very long history, and so we have information for a thousand years or more on the seismicity. It seems to me like there's a dilemma facing scientists in this area, that you don't want to cry wolf, and yet you do know a lot about what's happening in, in interpreting seismic data. Where are scientists headed, and how do they feel about this issue now? Well, uh, my feeling is that we have been riding on, uh, in the eastern U.S., on the conception of very little earthquake hazard, basically a misconception. And this is probably to be uh, connected with the fact that the last great earthquake, let's call them great earthquakes, mm -hmm. occurred in 1886 before um, most people's memory, all, essentially everybody's memory. Right. In other words, people have forgotten about the large earthquakes and they, and they, all they have seen in the last 30 or 40 years are intermediate size earthquakes. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a, a large earthquake such as the Charleston earthquake would be an entirely different story. So I think it, it's our duty as seismologists to make people aware that there is a hazard. Do you think we're ever going to reach the point where scientists will be able to accurately predict earthquakes, say, within a day or a week? Eventually we'll get there. But again, I think it's going to be uh, specific to a given area and a given tectonic condition. I don't think we're going to have a formula which will answer the problems everywhere. So I think the, the predict earthquake prediction should be studied as a problem linked to a particular environment. For example, earthquake prediction in California may uh, use certain techniques and certain understanding which will apply there and may not apply to the eastern U.S. or to China or other places. In 1975, Chinese scientists issued an earthquake prediction that caused the evacuation of Haichung. An earthquake of magnitude 7.3 hit only days later. Thousands of lives were saved. Yet for every successful prediction, the Chinese have sounded at least 10 false alarms. Accurate prediction of natural disasters continues to elude the world scientists. But as they're learning more about the process that makes the Earth tremble, they're also pinpointing the areas most at risk. What to do with that scientific information is a complex question facing public officials, haunted by the tale of the boy who cried wolf once too often. For Innovation, I'm Jim Hartz.
Thank you.